Um, before I start, let's just bow our heads with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the Sabbath day you've given us, Lord. Uh, thank you for another opportunity, Lord, that we get to come here together to praise you, to worship you, and to love you even more, Lord. I pray, Lord, as I to go through the message, Lord, I pray that you speak through me, Lord. Let it be your words, not my words, Lord. And forgive the sins we come against thee, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my sermon is, Why Me? Um, it's a question that we probably ask all the time. Um, it's probably the question we ask because, why me? What's so special about I? Why do I have to do it, right? So we start our message today with a verse in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13. And Moses, but it says, But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Please, just send anyone else, Lord. See, these are the words of Moses after God had asked Moses to go to Pharaoh, right? And to bring his people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who, who has heard the term of imposter syndrome before? Yeah? Or it can be known as the fraud, fraud syndrome or the imposter experience. It's actually more common than you guys think if you guys have never heard of it, right? Because I know a lot of people in their everyday lives, they've experienced this. Um, such as in, at work or in relationships or in friendships. And I am one who actually experiences this often as well. So what is imposter syndrome? To keep it simple, imposter syndrome, syndrome is when you doubt your own skills and success. Like, so sometimes you feel you're not as talented or as worthy as others believe, and you're scared that one day people will realize that, Right? And that's where you get the imposter from. And this can unfortunately lead to negative self-talk, cause anxiety, and even lead to depression. So an example where I experience imposter syndrome in my life is when I'm in a meeting full of seniors and execs, right? And they're talking and they're saying all this jargon and all that stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, how did I manage to get myself into this room? These guys are just... They're up there, they know what they're talking about, and I'm just here sitting there like twiddling my thumbs, I have nothing to contribute, I can't say anything, I shouldn't say, I feel like I shouldn't say anything, I feel like whatever I say doesn't mean anything. But you, it's funny because the reason why I'm in that room is because my bosses see something that I don't see. They think that I'm worthy to be in that room, even though I feel that I don't feel like I belong in that room. See, that's the, inter that's the interesting thing about people who experience imposter syndrome, right? is that these individuals are actually usually highly accomplished and just generally impressive individuals. On the outside, from others' perspectives, right, not from theirs, but from others' perspectives, there's an apparent reason for them to feel like an imposter syndrome. Actually, there's no reason, actually, sorry. And yet, they still feel like it. So from what we are going to study today, you can almost make the argument that one of the most highly recognized people in the Bible might have dealt with something similar. To imposter syndrome. We're going to start our studies in Exodus chapter 3, right? So we can all, all open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. For some context, we're going to, this is where Moses sees the burning bush, right? And he approaches it and he is in absolute awe before God, right? And we're going to pick it up from verse 7, where God says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmaker, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and a large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the per Perizzites and the Hivites and the... Yeah, you get what I'm going. And we're going to go to verse 10. And he says this, Come now, therefore... And I'll send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. See, God has presented a task to Moses, right? And it's actually not an easy task if you think about it, because the task that God has presented to Moses actually can affect generations to come, right? That's huge. And God has essentially told Moses, hey, you're the one I've chosen for this task. I know you can do it. But how does Moses feel about this? Does he have the same confidence that God has in him? He says in verse 11, But Moses said to him, 
said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I? And that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. How many of us here today can relate to the response that Moses gives to God, right? Who am I? I'm just an average Joe who lives in Frankston. I'm too young to do things. I'm just an ordinary person. I'm a person with a lot of baggage in life, right, Lord? I've got a past that I'm not proud of. I've gone through too many things. I'm a failure. I failed so many times, Lord. Who am I? God, you've got the wrong guy. Who am I? See, like many of us, Moses thought God was speaking to the wrong guy. But I like to ask you this question. Is God ever wrong, guys? And I want you guys to think about this answer, right? Because, yes, we can say for certain that God is never wrong, right? But if God is never wrong and he's chosen you to do a certain thing, why do we say no? Why do we make excuses why we can't do it? See, see, the Creator has chosen you. He's picked you out. He has handpicked you out knowing that you are the right person for the job, that you are actually capable of doing more than you think. And I want the kids to remember this as they grow up, right? You are more capable than you actually think. God has chosen you to serve. Today, God puts you guys up in the front because he believes that you guys are capable of serving him, right? It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter your skills that you have. God has chosen you guys, right? And to really give us insurance, God says this to Moses, and no doubt he says it to us. So he said in verse 12, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on the mountain. See, it is important for us to understand this point. God doesn't tell Moses to go do it alone, but he says, I will certainly be with you. Moses wasn't told to go bring the children out of Israel by himself, by his own might. No, right? But he was told that God would be with him. God is going to be with him in every step of the way, just like when we are too afraid to do something on our own, right? For example, you buy something on Facebook Marketplace and it's like 50 kilometers away. You always tell someone, can you come with me? Can you come in to go pick this up? You know, I don't want to be by myself, right? It's the same thing. God tells us to do something and he's not going to let you do it by yourself. He's going to come into the car with you and he's going to go with you, right? We'll never do things alone. Because only God can take us from nothing to something, from zero to hero. See, our God is an active God, guys. Our God chooses to serve us because that's just how much he loves us, right? Do you guys realize when the creator, the creator, God Almighty, says to go, right? He's really saying, I got your back. And does he really have your back? Yeah, he does have your back. And time and time again, not only the story of the Moses, we see this in the story of right, the whole Bible, that whenever God tells someone to do something, it's never by themselves. God is always with them every step of the way, right? And there's no doubt we can tell that in our stories, in our lives, right? When we've gone through a hard point in time and we've prayed to God, God, help us. God is always with us. And somehow we always make it out of the way, make it to the other side of the, what do you call it? The bright side of the tunnel, whatever. You get what I mean, right? This is who we serve. God is always with us no matter where we go. No matter how daunting the experience of what we're going to face, God promises that he will be with us. And friends, that's all we need. That's all we need from that promise, right? Because he promises Moses, I will certainly be with you. And to prove that Moses, and to prove to Moses that God will be with him and work through him, he starts with a simple stick, right? A simple rod that Moses had in his hand. A rod that God would actually use as a symbol of his power. So let's skip forward now. Let's go to chapter 4, guys. And we'll start our reading from there. So we're going to start from verse 1. And it says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and he caught it and it became, and it became a rod in his hand. So we see here an objection 
from Moses, right? In the very first verse of chapter 4, it says, Then Moses answered, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice, right? And say, Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Interesting enough, if we actually study chapter 3, if we had a bit more time, if we study chapter 3 a bit more closely, this is actually Moses' third objection to God calling him, calling him to do something, right? Calling him out. I come from this conversation. He says, what if they will not believe me? Or, and what if they will not listen to my voice, Lord? Now, I, want, I would imagine this would be stated in a hypothetical way, right? It wasn't that Moses was totally denying any chance of Israel would receive him. But he's throwing out the possibility that hypothetically, they might not receive him. So right now, we can probably all agree together, right? That what we're seeing right now, what we're reading right now, we see a man who is not a shining example of faith. There's some unbelief that's going in, in Moses' heart right now, right? He, that he's wrestling. He's probably saying right now to himself, could God, could God really use my life? What if, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to my voice, Lord? You know, sidetrack though, just a note with this chapter. I love this chapter. I think it's one of the most... I think it's a pretty funny chapter, right? Because Moses always goes, God, what about this? And God's like, I got that covered. He's like, God, what about that? He's like, I've got that covered, right? You see, God tells Moses to throw his rod on the ground miraculously because he becomes a serpent. What happens when you guys see a snake in the wild? You run. I, I remember I saw one first time in my life. My stand still? No, you run. You jump and you run. You don't stand still. From my personal experience, I've jumped and I ran as fast as I could, right? And I guess this is kind of the same similar reaction that Moses did right here. He saw a serpent, he got scared, and he ran away. Although that's pretty funny, right, if we look at it, if we think about it, there is a lesson we can get from this. Could it be an image of what he's doing with these objections, right, where Moses says, why me, Lord? What if this happens? What if they don't believe me? Running is Moses really running from something that he is, thinks is abundantly scary, something that he feels like is a threat, or is Moses more like running from the call of God upon his life? But he should not be running from the call of God, just as he should not be running from this rod that God made into a serpent. You see, God was and is always in control, and he uses his, uh, Moses' life, right? And listen, there are, there are times in life where we feel the temptation to run from scary things, just like Moses did with that serpent, right? There's sometimes this temptation that we want to run from God's call because we are scared, we are frightened. We feel like sometimes we may need to bend the truth of God's word to fit our impulses or desires, or the Lord is, is asking us to do something that's actually too difficult and painful, and yet we resist, right? And what I'm trying to tell you here today, friends, is we should not run from the call of God. We should run to things that the Lord has asked us to do. And the reason being is there's a quote from here from Helen Keller, who was an American author, right? And she was born in Alabama, and she actually lost her sight and her hearing, and she dealt with numerous illnesses um, when she was 19 months old. And she comes up with this. She says, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experiences of trial and suffering can character be really developed, right? So how many times have we said yes to difficult things that God has put in front of our lives? The difficult things that God has asked us to do, and I have no doubt, right, we have benefited greatly from these experiences that we've gone through that is difficult. It may not be at the present moment, but when you look back at it, You've, you, you experience the benefit from it, right? Our character has developed to be more like God's, right? And God will continue to provide new openings, new opportunities, new experiences whenever we say yes to those scary things that God asks us to do. And I pray, friends, that we continually say yes to God whenever he calls us, whenever he asks us to do something, whenever someone asks you to do the prayer, whenever someone asks you to do the welcoming, whenever someone asks you to do, take a job in the church, I continue to pray that we say yes, because you're not being picked for randomly. God has chosen you to do it. What else can we learn another thing from the first sign that God had performed, right? Perhaps what's being communicated with his first sign, right, is, the, the, is that snakes symbolizes power, 
and life to the Egyptians. But God was declaring to Moses that he would overcome that powers that are in Egypt, right? So remember, if we skip forward, right, he would eventually perform this sign, right, with the, with the serpent. And when Moses did this in front of Pharaoh, what happened to the other serpents, right? Moses the serpent ate the, uh, the Pharaoh's serpents, right? In other words, to keep it basic, God's power is more powerful than the Egyptians' power. God's power is more powerful than anything that's holding you back from saying yes. Just remember that God is always stronger. So let's continue on to the story in verse 6. So it says, Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand back in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and he drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it restored like his other flesh. So in verse 6, I didn't go next. So in verse 6, Moses puts his hand in basically in his cloak, right? That's what it's saying in his bosom, in his cloak. And when he draws it out, his hand is what? Full of leprous. Then he puts it back inside in his cloak and he draws it out again, and his hand is restored like nothing happened, right? And I've read many commentaries on what this what this means. Um, but like like I always do, I like to keep things very simple, right? The simple message with this story, this part is, God is able to restore. Whether that might be the restore the health or even restore the hearts of the Egyptians or even the Israelites, right? God is able to restore the heart, to cleanse the heart. And God wants to do that for every one of us today, right? And everyone around us, if we just allow him to do so. And he has proven this with Moses, right? But even after all these signs that God had performed, you would hope that Moses was convinced, right? And, and that, it, um, that it wasn't all up to him, that God would actually be with him, right? God's proven his power. God has proven that God, that I will be with you, Moses, right? But Moses still being overwhelmed by the thought of the work that he has to do, he came up with an excuse that I, love to, I used to come up with all the time, right? This is my favorite excuse. Verse 10, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your, be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. I used to say this all the time. What about my difficulty in speech? I cannot speak, and I probably still can't speak because my wife laughs at me every time I mispronounce something every single day. But perhaps Moses had a speech, in, um, something wrong with his speech, or it just wasn't his strongest point. Or perhaps Moses was simply afraid of public speaking. Like so many people are, right? It's common. Or perhaps Moses was trying to find a way to wiggle out of God's calling upon his life. Either way, God's answer to this was pretty crystal, crystal clear. He just says, who made man's mouth? In other words, Moses, again, let me remind you, I am in control. I will give you the word to speak. I made your mouth and I will make you be the messenger that you must become for the people of Israel and to Pharaoh, right? You may not feel eloquent, you might not feel that you are quick of speech and in tongue, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, Moses. I made your mouth and I can empower your mouth and your words according to my will. See, even with our deepest fear, God will help us, no matter what it is. And I think it's an important lesson that we should always learn, right? Never let your deepest fear, whatever it may be, stop you from serving God. But remember to experience what God can do for you in your life. You need to take that step of faith, right? To really experience God's power, you need to take that step of faith. And if you don't allow yourself to be vulnerable, how do you really know? How do you really know that you actually need God? Right? If you don't allow him to work. Take that step and believe that God will be with you. How do I really know that God would actually help me with my speech problem? 
How would God, how would I really know that God would help me with my confidence problem? It's until I stepped up on here is when I knew that God had my back. People say preaching is pretty scary, but the funny thing is, once my words come out of my mouth, or once God's words come out of my mouth, I don't feel that fear anymore. And I can't explain it. I don't, I never practiced it, you know, like I've never gone to conferences to teach me how to speak, publicly speak. But the only, only explanation I can find is that God is helping me right now, right? It is not me that's speaking out here. It's God that's giving me the confidence to be able to preach his word, right? It's only when you allow yourself to go into this vulnerable state, open yourself up and allow yourself to see God's power. So we go to verse 13 and it says, But he said, this is what all, something else I also do as well. Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Right? Ian, can you preach the Sabbath? Oh, get someone else, please. Don't get me, Lord, please. I'll help you find someone else. Right? There's always excuses to get someone else to step up. Verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he's also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth with his and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. In verse 17, well, sorry, I didn't skip. And you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. Now Moses' final objection is, is really simple, right? Why don't you find someone else? Lord, why have you chosen me? I, I don't want to do this ministry, Lord. I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this work, he says. Please, please, please send someone else. Now at this point, we just have to pause and observe the humanness of Moses, right? And I bet we've all felt this way. God, please just send someone else. Get someone else to do it. I, I'm so tired. I can't do this particular work, Lord. I'm not, right, I'm not the right person for the job. I, I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have this skill. I don't have that, right? It was Moses' cry to God, please, God, send someone else. Now for this part, right, the Lord says in verse 14, and his anger kindled against Moses. Why was God getting frustrated at Moses at this point? Maybe it was likely because he knew that Moses maybe was speaking out of disobedience even more than he was speaking out of fear, right? See, God knows who he is. God knows his power and might, and God perhaps wanted Moses to have more confidence in him, right? More faith and trust in his ability, and in his own ability. But we can also say, is it a possibility that Moses had all those things, but there was a merely different spirit within his heart, that it wasn't actually fear or insecurity, but that all these questions were a mask for the simple reality that simply Moses didn't want to go. Let's think about it, right? When God appeared to Moses, Moses was like, what, 80 years old? He'd been living as a shepherd, shepherd, right, in the wilderness for so many years. His family was developing. He was probably comfortable with life. See, are we sometimes like that as well with our lives today, right? Are we sometimes comfortable in the way we're living our lives are we pretty content how we have our life right now, right? Are we happy to perfectly go to church every Saturday, sit, sit wherever we usually sit, and then go back home, right? Are we, are we feeling content that we don't want to get outside our comfort zone to serve God? Do we have that same feeling sometimes, right? Are we stuck in our same old routine? Look, I'm not actually saying that it's bad, but, but it shouldn't be the reason why we are hesitant to say yes to God when he calls us out, right? Have we? Because we always got to remember, guys, that uh, what is our real purpose here on earth, right? What is our real purpose? It's to serve other people. And sometimes that involves us getting outside our comfort zone. That sometimes us accepting the call from God wherever he tells us to go. So the Lord announces to Moses, well... If you're really nervous about doing this work, I will actually send your brother, Aaron, the Levite, to join you in ministry, and he's coming out right now, in fact. He'll be, be ecstatic to help you, you know. You've got to speak to him, put the words in his mouth, 
and he will be a messenger for you. And as we know, as we know from the story, Moses was going to serve as Moses' prophet, right? So it, it, it's so interesting, this story. See, God provided for every excuse that Moses had. Moses had an excuse, and God said, nope, got that covered. What's your next one? And I think this is a good moment to self-reflect at times that we have made excuses when called upon, right? We can see here that God has all bases covered on everything that could go wrong. So the real question I have for you guys here today is, why isn't the work getting done? Are we missing that vital connection, that, that relationship with God to be able to trust him when we say yes to the work that he's asking us to do? And does this show us how much we truly need to rely on God, right, to get the work done? Because if it was just for us to do it on our own, we would end up being like Moses, just making all these excuses up and not get anything done. Ellen Wright um, summarized the story like this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 255. She says, the, div the divine command given to Moses found himself distrustful, slow of speech, and timid. He was overwhelmed with a sense of his incapacity to be a mouthpiece for God to Israel. But having once accepted the work, he entered upon it with his whole heart, putting all his trust in the Lord. See, this is the key, my friends, right? Once we accept the work, we must put all our trust in God, right? We must, we must not rely on ourselves to complete the task, whether that may be the ministry that we've decided to do, whether it might be simply giving a Bible study to someone, right? We must do it wholeheartedly, right? Put all our effort into it and trust God that he will finish the work, right? As long as we allow ourselves to be in that position to help God, he will do the rest. Continuing on with the, uh, with the quote, the greatness of his mission called into exercise the best power of his mind. God blessed his ready obedience and he became eloquent, hopeful, self-possessed and well-fitted for the greatest work ever given to man. This is an example of what God does to strengthen the character of those who trust him fully and give themselves unreservedly to his commands. See, if we want to strengthen our character, we must put our faith into action. It's just like when we apply for a job, right? What holds bigger shoulder strength? Your experience or how many degrees you've got, right? No one really cares about your degrees and sometimes, right? They care about more experience. Why? By learning from our mistakes, our setbacks and small wins over time, we gain insights and understanding that simply cannot be developed when we just read. And I, want, and I believe it's the same with our walk, right? We need to get up and accept the work that God has called us upon to experience what he can really do. Put into practice what we learn every single day, right? So we can see from our learnings today that just like Moses, we may have a lot of excuses. While we say no at times to the work of God is asking us to do, but because we don't want to do, or we, sometimes we just don't feel capable of doing it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, as Ellen White continues to say, as she says in Patriarch's Prophets as well. The fact that a man feels his weaknesses is at least some evidence that he realizes the magnitude of work appointed to him, and that he will make God his counselor and his strength. Guys, it's okay to feel like it's, oh, it's too big of a job. It's okay to feel like sometimes maybe I can't do it. But it's your actions after that, right? Do you dwell on that feeling and allow that to be your, your, your meaning why you say no? No, it, you, this should lead you to God and realize I've got this weakness, but I have this help and I've got this line and now I'm going to go to God for that, right? So in conclusion to the service, right? And if you just tuned in because I said conclusion, that's good because there's one thing I want you guys to remember from this sermon, right? God didn't choose you because there's no one else to choose from, right? Or he didn't choose your name out of the hat, pick your hat randomly out of the hat. But God has chosen you because he actually believes in you guys. He knows that what you're capable of doing and whether you know it or not, all he's asking you to do is to just trust him to allow him to work through you and just 
friends, just watch the power of God unfold. Remember, if Moses was able to accomplish everything, just starting with a piece of a stick, like a rod, imagine what God could really do in your life, guys. We may be hesitant at first like Moses, but I pray that we eventually step up like God has called us. And don't be afraid to remember the promises that God gave Moses at the start, right? This is the one we should always live by. He will certainly be with you. So serve God on that promise, friends, right? That he will certainly be with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath day you have blessed us. A day where we can remember that salvation is only found through Jesus. A day where we can remember that no matter where or when you call us to serve, that we can always rely on you and to cling on to that promise that you tell us that you will certainly be with us. So I pray, Lord, that you continue to develop our character, to be willing to accept your call, to be willing to serve others around us, and to be willing to have that faith in you. So thank you, Lord, for loving us, for caring us, and for helping us with all our short shortfalls. Help us to see how special we are and how we can truly, fully rely on you, Lord. I want to thank you for everything you've done, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.